Last year, we embarked on the biggest journey we've ever been on. An epic road trip digging into the history of English IPA in a bid to breathe new life into the style that birthed the American craft beer revolution, but was then left behind. The idea was to create a new recipe with Meantime Brewing that used historic ingredients, but created beautiful modern flavours. And while exploring the stunning Hawkins Hop Farm, we learned that our documentary couldn't have been better timed. The British hop industry is in crisis, with barely 50 farms left and fields still being ripped out every year thanks to a decline in traditional British brewing, competition from other hop growing regions and the challenges of global heating. Britain was once the biggest hop growing region in the world and if we want to stop it disappearing completely, there's only so much time left. A year on, Meantime's head brewer Joe joined us as we visited Sarah Hawkins' farm again, this time during harvest. We wanted to find out if our documentary and steps taken by hop farmers and merchants like Charles Fareham had made any difference. We also got to explore the secret nursery where modern British aroma varieties are being crossbred to see what the future of British hop growing might look and smell like if it manages to flourish. So Sarah, it's wonderful to be back. Thank you very much for having us. Great to have you, you're welcome. This year we've come at harvest time, which feels like an incredibly exciting time. Is that the case for a hop farmer? Yes, hop picking is a very busy time. Uh, it's all go. The day starts at about seven and the machine gets switched on at seven and then uh, we work until about six. Right. With a couple, few breaks in between. And then the dryer man will stay until late into the night to dry the hops. Right, so if those but, hops are coming in at six, the, the yeah. kilns have to keep firing yeah. and processing those hops as quick keep as possible. Keep drying them, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's and right. How, how much are you managing to process a day and how much do you have to do sort of total uh, from your farm? We try and do eight kilns a day. So, that's I mean, what we try and do, yeah, we don't always right. do it. <laughs> I guess you're, it's weather dependent, it's crop dependent, it's yes. people yield dependent, dependent. Yes. yield dependent, yeah, yes. yeah, exactly, yeah. Obviously, yeah, the, the weather has a huge impact on, on what every harvest is, is like. What's it, what's it been like for this year's harvest? This year has been particularly challenging. Right. We had a very dry February, um, when normally we need rain, and then we had a cold, wet spring. And then we had a boiling hot June, mm. whole month of heat. Then a cold summer, rain, a bit of sun, rain, bit of sun. And then September came and we had the heat wave with humidity last week, which was very, very challenging for anybody working in the heat and the humidity. Yeah. And, and so dur during the rest of the year, what, what is a hop farmer sort of doing? So obviously at harvest, we know, we uh, can picture what's going on. What's yes, happening the rest so of that year uh, to you? After harvest, a couple of months later, uh, we'll cut the binds right down to the bottom and burn what's left. We'll also plant cover crops down the alleyways to hold, uh, stop erosion, put uh, matter back into the soil. And then season then begins again in March where we'll put the string up to, from the peg on the floor to the hook at the top and we'll put four strings per peg or per plant. Mm. We'll go up spaced out so that the light will get to the plant and then the hot plant will start to come out the ground and we'll train two shoots per string and we'll train them to go clockwise because the hot plant likes to follow the sun. Right and they'll grow and grow and they'll reach the top of the wires by the 21st of June, the longest day. And after, after that, they then make laterals, side branches. And then at end of July-ish, they'll start to produce little burrs, which will then turn into the hot flower yeah. and the cones. So they sort of look like little prickly... Yeah, little prickly burr yeah. things. They, they will then make the hot flower. Right. Turn into the hops. So then, the actual sort of the, the hops themselves sort of appear for about a month, a month and a half before they're... Uh, three weeks before three, hop right. picking. Okay. Yeah. So in burr for three weeks, in hop for three weeks uh -huh. is, is the old saying. Right. And then it all starts again. We always start on bank holiday Monday with the Goldings, always on the bank holiday Monday. <laughs> Come rain or shine, you, <laughs> yes, you get it down. Yeah. Right. It's amazing how sort of these natural rhythms occur. Like, you know, yeah. it's always ready by the longest yeah. day of the year and you're always taking it down on the the bank holiday in, yes. in August, it's sort of humans and nature 
have found their way around the year almost in that that's right in that yes. regard yeah yes. so you said that this year has been been particularly challenging has that sort of messed with those rhythms at all what, um, what are the challenges that are coming your way now uh weather patterns the extreme either extreme heat extreme uh, suddenly no rain or cold weather um it's, it's it seems to be rather than just sort of even out it's one or the other yeah um so that's been quite challenging pests and diseases this year have been quite challenging right. which is due to the weather conditions okay so like wet humid yeah conditions wet are always humid more... conditions so um the hops are s s s particularly the goldens are susceptible to molds so that's been quite challenging yeah and and, and what can farmers do with sort of well with these issues with with climate climate ha change happening goldings are susceptible to certain things is there anything that yeah can be done? not not really we can spray for for things um uh we keep the bottoms clean um and just make sure the plant is healthy because then it will fight off these help fight off the right, okay. pests and diseases so it's getting them in the best place to fight yes, for themselves yeah. essentially but we will have to spray spray more regularly yeah the older varieties will struggle more the newer varieties uh, as sort of bred to withstand pressures from mould and pests and diseases, we hope. <laughs> right, right, that's the intention, I <laughs> guess, of a lot of the climate the change, yeah. so hot, extreme heat hmm. we've had, they're, they're bred to withstand a bit of that. So, they, so their, their roots can go deeper and find more yeah. moisture, whereas yeah. like Goldings might have a shorter rootstock. And, yeah, maybe that. Yeah. Can we go have a look at some of the, yeah. uh, some yeah. of the hops? Let's have so a look. What yeah. variety is this? So we're picking Harlequin today. Yep. Uh, and these are quite young plants, um, but they're looking really nice. They've hopped all the way down. Uh, there's a good even spread of hops here. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, all, all the way up and, yeah, and to the bottom, the you've down. got these, these cones happening. Yeah. If you open them up, they smell lovely. And so ha Harlequin's a, a very, very new Ooh. variety that... Yeah, yeah, these are, these, well, yeah. this is the second year we're picking these. Um, so, yeah, like green apple new. and grapefruit, yeah. and yes. so there's sort of this yeah. twin twin advantage in new varieties. You can compete with yes. you know the rest of the world in terms of growing that right. and yes. grow in these these tricky conditions. Yes. Yeah, and and how much is sort of proportion between like in the the sort of heritage varieties and the modern varieties are you growing? Uh, is that going to change? We're probably yeah, we're probably um, one third traditional and two thirds. New ones. Wow, so now. it really has shifted yeah, to, shifted. to those modern varieties. Yes. Yeah, incredible. Yep. And so, so you've got like, I guess, Jester and Alicana, like the fathers of these. Yes. Have you brought in any new ones this year that you've been trying uh, on a bigger scale? I think we're going to try uh, Godiva next, which will be interesting. Yep. And we've got a really interesting plant in a trial in one of the plots that we're very hopeful on right, okay. developing that. Can't give a name yet. <laughs> But you, do you have a name? name? Oh, it hasn't got a name. You're not, you're not keeping a, a it from us. Yeah. Well, but that's uh, going to be really exciting yeah. if it takes off. I mean, I guess, mm. you know, it'd be very easy. And we, we kind of, in our documentary last year, painted it as, as quite a bleak kind of outlook for, for hop farmers. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd, firstly, is, is that true? Is it looking um, dire? And secondly, are there sort of Yeah, I, guess, I think we've got shoots? a bit more confidence now that the UK brewers are looking to buy British, mm -hmm. which is perfect. Uh, if they can buy British rather than from buying overseas, that will help us definitely. Um, and the new varieties, we can grow them, we can compete with the American market. And uh, so that's also given us confidence. Yeah. And, mm. and the, the new varieties are coping with, with all, weather whatever conditions. the climate's throwing yes. at them. Is, yes. is, it must be <laughs> very yeah. reassuring for you, for you day to day yes. as yes. much as the, the demand coming your way as well. That's right. Yeah. Well, I think it's time we had a little look at those exciting new varieties. Maybe give them a sniff, even if they can't have a name, because I think, you know, these heritage varieties are incredible and important to many of the breweries in the UK. Yeah. But it does feel like, to some extent, this is going to have to be the future of, of British art. Yeah. After talking to Sarah, we explored her brand new hot processing plant, where flowers are picked from the vines. It was a huge investment designed to improve yield and quality of each harvest. And from there we headed to the kiln, where the hops are dried and baled ready to be shipped out to breweries.
Both rooms were heavy with gorgeous, sticky hop aroma that stuck to our clothes and followed us to the secret location of Charles Fairham's nursery, where brand new crossbreeds are grown outside a laboratory for the first time to see which will thrive and which will literally wilt. Hidden amongst these binds could be the next Goldings or the next Citra that sends Burring in a whole new direction. So this is the nursery? It's, it's one of the nurseries, Johnny. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. Secret so, locations all over, Air 51's everywhere. Yeah, so, so actually when you're breeding and developing new hops, it's quite important that we surround them with commercial varieties. They have to be exposed to, to the, the sort of what, what a commercial hop would be exposed to. So tractors running over their roots, um, all the pests and diseases that we have to cope with. We want it to be as, as close to a normal hop, a commercial variety as possible. So it's like a real nursery, you expose them to all the, the viruses Absolutely. and everything. They come back they with be, all the viruses, yeah. all the snotty noses <laughs> that, uh, that kids do, yeah. Right, okay. We plant an area of one year's uh, seedlings in one area. So th this area here is one year's uh, so, well, it's part of one year's selection. So we've got uh, the first couple of rows, we've got some high alpha, potential high alpha varieties. So we're looking for a variety that's going to produce all that bitter acid. Internationally, there's, there's a big market for that. Yeah. And British hops are more sustainable than, than hops grown anywhere else in the He's world. He's going all in. He's and, going all in. And actually, we know that we don't have to irrigate these hops they will continue to grow through droughts. So we want to select them here, hopefully high alpha hops, so that we get some new high alpha varieties coming through and uh, they can supply brewers the world over. So you can use less of them acid. and use, you know, less and, heavily and irrigated. Less pesticides, and less, pesticides. less fertiliser. It's, it's a total green message. Right. Mm. Okay, well, do you want to show me around? So high alpha here. Yep, yep, so high alpha there. So if, if you want, we can have a little yeah, yeah. walk in. If I put one in my mouth, will I instantly know it's high alpha? You will do, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> so we'll do a little split here. So what, what you should Whoa. see, lots of resin in that, can you see? Yeah, yeah. And when you give it a bit of a rub, quite herbal and quite resinous, but it's nowhere near ready yet. Right, you've got this big old stalk in the middle. Yeah, and that's one of the things that shows ripeness. So when, right. when, the, when it's ripe, that will start to contract again. Uh -huh. So it's a big fat one at the moment, and yeah. it will, uh, it, as it senesces, that will start to contract. And that's S a sign. Senesces? Senesces, yeah. So it's a sign that the plant is starting to, instead of growing outwards, it's starting to bring the sap back down into the root, the sugars back into the root, thinking about next year. Right, OK. Oh, interesting. Okay. Right, yeah. That's really sticky, that one as well. It is really sticky. Really so, sticky. Yeah, feel free. There's, there's some others here. Look, look at that. I mean, if we were going to look for a hop and, and how we would want it to look and how we would want to pick it in the machine later, that is beautiful. It's hopping all the way down here, cones from top to bottom, um, and they're everywhere on it. I'm not a big fan of this. We call these loose cones. Sort of curling up. Yeah. Yeah, so these can break in the picker. And it's not altogether favourable. We don't want you to, you know, for a brewer or a home brewer to order these hops and for them to arrive as just a, a pile of petals. Yeah. We, we want something that's going to produce a nice whole cone hops. So this is all stuff you have to think about as you're crossbreeding. Like you'll be looking at that variety and going, like, is that susceptible to sort of curling out and, and not being uh, as uh, useful to a brewer? Uh, absolutely. We have to think of all sorts of things, yeah. don't we? Things that you wouldn't, you wouldn't normally think well, yeah, about. I never thought about the curvature of a hop leaf. So if we, if we have a look at these ones, we're seeing this is a sign of disease creeping in. Can you see it starts to break up? Yeah, yeah. So that's some powdery mildew and it just causes the the plant actually to pre senesce so it starts to ripen off early. Earlier than it should. Yeah, so look at these cones. Look, look at this. Absolutely ginormous. Never seen cones like them. So Whew. give it another. So lot, lots and lots of resin. So again, a big hop cone might be preferable, that, that feels more efficient. So actually what we tend to do is we actually select for small cones. Right. 
uh, the big cones look very nice and you look like you're getting a massive crop. Yeah. But actually, a small cone that's more densely packed with lupulin is, is a more efficient way of harvesting. So less of green harvesting. matter to yeah. lupulin, right. Yeah. So those look very nice, but, but actually I, I don't see it necessarily being a commercial variety. Is this what your explorations of a nursery is usually like? Just wandering around seeing something that looks promising and then going, let's have a sniff? We spend hours walking <laughs> up and down systematically looking for hop. We don't want to miss anything. See, that's got a really nice tropical passion fruit. Yeah, there. yeah. Um, Quite melony. Yeah, yeah. It smells like really, really ripe sort of green melon. Nice. Mm. Yeah, so what we do is we, we mark the plants that we like with a tape and then we come and hand pick samples of these. And from those hand picked samples, we do our aroma fests where we uh, put all of the varieties from that year into a big, big pile and, and check on them all. And from that, we will select plants that, that next spring will come and take cuttings from and propagate them into right. larger volumes. So these are these are single plants at this point, and you might and they exist nowhere else in the world. Yeah. So they are they are their own new variety, if you like. Yeah. So somewhere in here is potentially like you know the new citra or the the new harlequin or the new golding or Ab absolutely kind of... could, could could be could be something big in there. Yeah. Come on, J8. Come on, Melanie. And so how, across all of your nurseries, how how many? like new crossbreeds do you have each year? We plant 15,000 seeds a year. Wow. Roughly 10,000 of those actually germinate. You right. know, we don't have a 100% success rate, if you like. Um, and we use uh, an attritional method to reduce those down so that by the middle of summer, we have about 2,500 seedlings and, and then we plant them out like this. Mm -hmm. Those two. So this this is about 500 seedlings that we planted out uh, three years ago. Right. And we do so that we produce two and a half thousand every year. So we have to move move around where the nurseries are. Yeah. And, and so to put that in context, you know, how many commercial varieties have you released in the last say decade? Because so that would have been like 25,000 seedlings planted. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay, so, so we've released Jester, Olicana, Harlequin, Mystic Godiva, um, Archer, Minstrel. And they, those are really the commercial ones that we've released. But in the Czech Republic, they're trying to breed a replacement for Sarts. Mm. And they've been planting uh, 20,000 seedlings every year, no, 50,000 seedlings for the last 20 years. So they planted a million new varieties to try and replace sarts. They haven't found it and yet. And they haven't found it yet. So it, it, it's all about the numbers. Yeah. Have you, have, you, have you done a run of these hops and found anything you're excited about as there, yet? There is one I'm excited about. Can, can, um, can we go to that? Yeah, hop? yeah, we can go to that hop. This one's given up the ghost. It's this one. So, hey? Some of them, if they don't reach the top wire, can slide down the string. Right, okay. Yeah, so this is a daughter of Harlequin. It's not quite ready yet, but look at all that oh resin. God. Look at that. Wow. Sweet fruit. Yeah, yeah, mangoey right off the bind. That's. Mm. That's remarkable. Yeah, and, and if you look at it, it's got quite a nice growth habit. We quite like this. We call it columna, so uh, so a narrow bind. It's <laughs> super cliche to say. It almost smells like a New England IPA. Just you can just almost taste the beer. Yeah, yeah I, and I, I I must confess that quite often when Peter and I have finished going up and down hundreds and hundreds of seedlings, we need to sit down <laughs> with a really hoppy beer. To satisfy that. that yeah, like your old factory's had it, but your palate hasn't. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God. It's a physical need. It is now. Mm.
With a head full of ideas and hop oils, it was time for a beer. So we headed to the idyllic Oak Inn just down the road. There we got to crack the second edition of Now IPA, a now annual meantime seasonal brewed to show off the latest exciting British hop varieties, as well as British malts and yeast. I sat down in the garden with Joe to talk about the importance of making this beer permanent and supporting our British hop growers. So it's been a hard day in the hop fields yes. for everyone except for us. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience and now we're going to round it off with a beer in the pub garden. Great, best way. It's, yeah, it's tough what we do. So this is now IPA V2, yes, essentially. It is. T tell me about this beer. What, what's the similarity between what we made together last year? So we built on more or less the same malt base. Um, as last year, so uh, uh, pale ale malt with a Chevalier malt as the sort of heritage um, malt. And we've used Jester and Olicana, similar to last year, and we've used a new experimental hop called CF185, which is uh, new from Charles Farron. Right. T tell me what you got from that hop when you rubbed it and why you chose it. So what we got from the, from the hop, we got a lot of um, like stone fruit, cherry, um, with a sort of hint of lime and maybe a bit of passion fruit. That's what I was just—I yeah. was about to say lime from that. Really lovely, bright citric character to it. Yeah, really good. Um, and what we really want to push with this beer—I mean, it was sort of championed by you guys and, and, and the work we did last year. Really, really exciting brew. But we want to um, use this as a, uh, a vessel to champion innovative UK hops mm -hmm. every year and we'll uh, use different hops each year and try and um, uh, shine the light on those hops um, as, as we go forward with it. Because you, So your, your lager is already, is that 100% British ingredient? It is, yeah. So yeah. we've got 100% um, British malt, uh, quite a simple malt base. It's just uh, Pills malt and, and pale, um, all grown in Essex mm -hmm. and made in Essex. Um, and then we use Goldings, so it's single hopped beer, um, Goldings for bittering, Goldings for aroma, um, yeah, and then our pale ale um, is a mix of American and, and British, but um, yeah, more Goldings in that, um, and then we have done some seasonal varieties, um, so our uh, record store day beer, which I am I'm modelling the t-shirt for now, this year was a um, sort of 50-50 brew, which was um, Admiral, which is a UK hop and um, and Citra from America, but right. they complement each other very nice. So yeah. I guess it's I mean meantime way way back when was was partly about you know Germanic styles as sort of the origin, but increasingly about British ingredients. And so you were already doing that when we came along, but this is sort of a new kind of adventure into the the modern stuff that can be done because I think everyone thinks of British ingredients as mostly cask led traditional British brewing. Yeah, yeah. not so much on the keg exciting. Yeah, uh, so I mean, starts. not that not that a lager is is not exciting. But, oh, it's dead exciting. Um, yeah, the, uh, the 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 kind of flavours and aromas we're expecting from that beer are not going to be your punchy tropical yeah. aromas. Um, we get a lot out of Goldings when we use it in in, in, in Greenwich Lager. Um, but what we're we're trying to do here is a, a a modern British IPA. Really get a lot of those fruity flavours just from British ingredients. Um, and and the key to that is the hops. So, um, yeah. And, and it's, from, from what we, we saw in the nursery, what you've rubbed already with Charles Farron before, are, are you excited about, you know, future varieties of this? Because it must be quite nerve wracking to, to make that kind of pledge to be like, this is going to be championing these exciting new hops. So every year it's now going to be like, are we going to find something this year that excites us? Yeah, so, I mean, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get um, down the line. You, you, you do have an idea because hops take years to, to develop. Mm. So we, you know, we, we know what we're looking for next year. There's a, there's a very exciting hop called K9, which um, is, is not a, it's not a dog, but it is a, uh, <laughs> an exciting hop with um, a lot of tropical notes. Um, and um, we found like, particularly with, with CF185, um, rubbing it and, and smelling those, those hops, you're often not sure if, those hops can transfer into the beer, but they, they really did with, with CF185. I'm hoping that they will with K9. But what, what's been interesting from today's experience and, and from other hop rubbings that, that I've done is also that not only are we, you know, obviously the aim is to grow stuff that's gonna be long-term growable in the UK with the changing climate, 
uh, that's going to meet the demand that drinkers have for American style aromas. But also, like what you said with this, you know, there's lime, there's cherry, which is not something you necessarily associate with with many American varieties. So there's there's also a point of difference. It's not just competing with American hops. It's it's complementing as well. It's going. Yeah. Well, we have our own flavors, our own terroir. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're bringing that, and that's definitely evident in this beer. You know, and that was. I mean, Brad's original intention was to not make an English IPA and not make an American IPA, but to find something that was uniquely British and had its own yeah. space. I think you've achieved that with this beer. And hopefully, you know, that's what Charles Farham are going to continue to do as they go along the line. Finding these brilliant, unique hops like Olacana is, is its own thing, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's incredibly exciting for us to have, have that kind of opportunity. On, on the, you know, the more agronomic and the, the climate kind of side... How seriously is, is, is Asahi and obviously meantime taking that element of, of hop growing and supporting British ingredients? Uh, very seriously. So it's really from a sustainability point of view, especially for us as a, as a sort of craft brewery, importing a lot of hops from America is not really great for our carbon footprint, for um, the water that's used to produce those uh, hops in America is, is incredible. We've heard some... Um, incredible but also kind of scary facts uh, today of um, i think it was a, a kilo of hops uses something like 1500 liters of water uh, in america whereas in the uk there there's very little irrigation across across uk hop farms so you, you you're not going to be using that water mm -hmm. that obviously then also has its own challenges but um so if you've you've got a particularly hot summer it can affect the the, the crop but um, from a sustainability point of view, it's it's very good. It's very good for a carbon footprint. Um, so if we can if we can make that that switch over the and it's going to take years to 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 push more British hops. It's better for us. It's better for the planet. And it it's creating unique beers. Exactly, like and and it will preserve because because the, the hop industry is is part of our culture and our heritage, um, and it will help preserve that. Mm. So. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. We should all be drinking more British, Absolutely. British hopped beers, e eating and drinking more British malt, um, and spending more time in beer gardens in, in Herefordshire. Yeah, cheers. As always, we left the pub feeling a little bit better about the world. The new British varieties are bedding in, brewers are starting to get excited about their possibilities, and the beers we've seen from all sorts of breweries, including Meantime, a testament to both. There's still a long way to go to bring British hop farming back from the brink and a lot of work to be done in the industry and at a political level. But as beer lovers, happily the best thing we can do is drink the product of all that hard work.